Welcome back, business leaders, to week four of the Salt Lake Chamber's Cybersecurity Leadership Council Fall Conference. Remember, this is a series going all through October and November. We're glad you've joined us today. Quick reminder before we get started, just to remember, there's a Series 5 Apple Watch that you can win in an opportunity drawing that will take place at the end of the series in November. That's generously donated by Strong Connections. And so we're keeping track of those of you who have participated and you get more and more tickets for that opportunity drawing for each of these webinars that you attend live. So today's presentation is going to be about the future of connected devices presented by John McClurg with BlackBerry. Now, as he presents, make sure to be thinking of questions you wanna ask him because at the end, we'll have a Q&A session with John. And so in the Zoom window, the little Q&A chat feature. Feel free to plug in your questions there as they come to you throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll facilitate some discussion with him as we go. Without further ado, John McClurg with BlackBerry. Hello and welcome. I'm John McClurg, Chief Information Security Officer and Senior VP at the new BlackBerry. Welcome to this, another in our continuing series of special webinars hosted by the Cybersecurity Leadership Council of the Salt Lake Chamber. Today's topic of conversation, one actually suggested by the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month programmers, the future of connected devices. Throughout the three decades of my deeply entrenched career in security, I've encountered myriad obstacles and enigmas, and at times, downright pandemonium. In fact, you could say without the risk of hyperbole that my tenure has been dominated by three Cs, chaos, complexity, and assorted other conundrums. And in that respect, I suspect I haven't been alone. Even when I happened upon isolated security solutions that could address a portion of the many challenges poised against me, their, their diverse implementations left me a complexity, a defense in depth, if you will, or what I call an expense in depth, that was formidable and which ultimately contained gaps that left me with integration challenges. Those gaps were spaces through which my adversaries knew that they could attack, at least until such time I could successfully integrate them under a common protective umbrella. In order to combat these challenges thrust upon me, I responded with three C's of my own. You can see them in the lower left-hand corner here. Three C's of my own, spearheading an organization that was converged, cored, and connected. Physical and cybersecurity operations nestled under one organizational umbrella highlighted the converged tenet. By cord, I ref I'm referring to the stru a structure reduced in size to what I call its minimally essential core. An insight I gained when asked to reduce my organization when Lucent was going down its financial drain. Finally, being connected meant my taking deliberate engineering steps to link heretofore disparate solutions that could communicate with each other, share rich data stores on a single platform from which to command a superior view of the cybersecurity battle space. That result usually consumed no small amount of time, energy, and financial resources. The end structure left me with a sense of what I imagined it must be like to bring a child into this world. It brought with it a sense of loyalty, affection, commitment to its preservation, which accounts for in part the inertia that seemed to hold me prisoner at time when it came to ever acknowledging or accepting that anything good could be or better could come along. That I received accolades from the security industry for the elegance of what I put into place also contributed to my unconscious mental reticence. That journey has been a remarkable one in times that are not infrequently characterized as interesting. In fact, if you may have hear me, heard me speak occasionally where I'll, I'll lead off with this phrase, may you live in interesting times, and then ask those listening to me, have I just cursed you or blessed you? Growing up, I always thought that was indeed a blessing. It wasn't until lately that some colleagues of mine pointed out that Robert Kennedy, in a speech given shortly before his death, made reference to that same phrase and characterized it as an old Chinese curse. But whether you think of it as a curse or a blessing, and you know it's probably both, 
uh, what makes these times particularly interesting, and this was even before COVID-19 hit our radar screen, was the rate and pace at which technologies are evolving. Uh, and the rate and pace at which these connected devices are being invented and put out there, it all uh, comes together in a very interesting way. Uh, in his book, The World is Flat, uh, Tom Friedman opined that what make these times particularly interesting is the, the way in which traditional boundaries of interest in part pushed by that, that uh, innovation of technology, we're gonna grow ever more porous. Whether that's the distinction we draw between cyber and physical, domestic and international, public and private, church and state, business and security, online, offline, work or home, the boundaries between those tra traditional delineations, we're gonna go ever more porous. And of course, that porosity has only been exacerbated by what we've seen of late, this, this internet of things, or as I like to characterize it as the internet of everything because of the number of, of appliances and things that are now connecting themselves to that internet, including even humans. Uh, if you have any friends who have had Hodgkin's disease, and we know that some of them are connecting their brains actually to the internet. And we as humans usually take umbrage with being called a thing, so that's why I tend to call it the internet of everything. But with this increase in connectivity, of course, comes an increase in the number of threats or avenues of attack open to an adversary. And when you understand and appreciate that they estimate that by 2025, we're going to see over 75 billion of these devices, these internet of things, these, these entities connected to the internet, you, get a, you start to gain a, a sense or an appreciation of that scope. I don't really understand the word billion. I, I usually say 75,000 uh, million uh, as, as, as an equivalent of the 75 billion, but 75 billion devices by 2025. And when we appreciate that the, the projected uh, global population by that time is estimated to be about 8.2 billion, that almost means about 10 devices per, per every human being on the face of the planet being connected in one shape or another to that, that internet. And of course, uh, with that, that, that growing chaos and that churning uh, environment in which we have to act, it becomes all the more complex, in part because of that speed of innovation that's only going to continue, the expanding attack, attack service that comes with that. And with that attack service, which really makes that, that something of, of concern or a risk is the, the exponential number of vulnerabilities that will endow themselves or embed themselves in, that, in those attack services. And what's interesting, a lot of these vulnerabilities that we'll see, the emerging vulnerabilities are old ones that, that we used to characterize the, the network environment, the endpoints that we thought had, we'd see almost the, the last of, but are, are going to see a resurgence as these new uh, devices start to connect themselves and will adopt unthinkingly some of these vulnerabilities that we've, we've known about that these newcomers do not. And we'll see that as an interesting variable that'll, that'll complicate the environment. The types of endpoints we've already, you know, uh, wearables, uh, the tablets, I mean, the, the, the types of endpoints, the, whether it's your doorbell, your fish tank, your refrigerator, the, 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 the list goes on and on. But the, just the number then of agents that are in, in, embedded in these various devices uh, will be a, a number that contributes to that chaos. And then, of course, what makes it complicated for those of us who are in the trenches fighting is that the number of vendors that will be coming at us are just, just go off the chart. Uh, my my day is often assailed with I don't know how many calls from different vendors now offering this or that sort of solution, and that adds to a, a cloud or a, a complexity with, we're we're grappling with. Of course, then the offense the offensive side of things is getting more and more interesting, particularly with the geopolitical tensions that are out there and the number of consoles that all these different solutions put into our environment that make it even more complex as a as a, an environment to wrap our our arms around. So that's that, that context and environment into which these growing number of connected devices are, are contributing or are ending. Of course, we're trying to wrap around and think of ways to, to sort of mitigate or, or aid us in, in grappling with all those increasing uh, potential vulnerabilities. Uh, just like we had in the physical world for some years now, these uh, labels mandated of nutritional facts that characterize uh, also lists the ingredients that go in and make up any particular item. We're seeing a parallel development now in the cyberspace of what we call software bill of materials where we're, we're seeing emerging standards and even regulations being considered where uh, these devices that are are going to attach themselves these 75 billion uh, devices will have associated with them a, a bill of materials that will 
position us hopefully to know just what sort of software is in there. So when a, a vulnerability is announced or an attack is announced, we can quickly look to our bill of materials and determine whether or not the, that particular warning has relevance for us, depending on what we've, we've got ourselves connected to, what we're using and, and utilizing. So I, I see some great uh, potential and opportunities there. That's no, no easy task. I think uh, some of us will be challenged a little bit if indeed there's that requirement imposed upon us to position ourselves so that we can tender to uh, our, our customers, uh, just what is that, that bill of materials, just what in the way of open source software and other things uh, are actually embedded in that that uh, is now connected to, to the internet. Of course, now in, in responding historically to <laughs> what are the current threats and, and vulnerabilities is something that we in the professions have always desired and, and wish to be proactively preventative. You know, that proverbial fence at the top of the cliff when in fact, uh, for a lot of different reasons, we, we found ourselves in, in the reactive detection space. We wanted to be proactive, but because either the data sources that would have given us a heads up were just beyond our ability to grasp, we found ourselves as that proverbial ambulance at the bottom of the hill. And of course, the response to the cybersecurity <laughs> uh, uh, the human response to cybersecurity chaos it has been anemic and, and deficient in a number of regards. I, I know when I was uh, finishing up my career in government and was considering going to the private sector, uh, many of my peers were concerned that, you know, you know, I was leaving a pension and was going to go into the private sector where uh, the lifespan of a CISO was at that time about 18 months. And uh, with the anemic performance at that time, even of signature-based antivirus, they said, look, you're going to leave your pension. You're going to go out there. And within short order, you're going to get compromised and you're going to get, fi you're going to get fired and you're going to be out on the street. And that was of no, no small, con uh, small concern. I was worried about that and actually massaged the expectations of the leaders of the companies to which I first went to, to anticipate that, that the, at least at that time, the bad guys did, ha did have an advantage over us. Uh, when you think of the way we classically have done antivirus with uh, you know the the signatures that we we had to attain and the 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 file the constant file updates that we had to advance in order to stay positioned to, to try and do battle and the ease with which the bad guys so could so easily uh, change or alter the um, the 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 signature it left us. Uh, quite often exposed and, and, and compromised. That's why people like John W. Thompson has is, 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 uh, acknowledged some time ago that we do need to shift the paradigm from the reactive technologies to more integrated solutions that deal with the variety and complexity of the, the threats out there uh, today. Uh, that those, those forces are what pushed and, and what Thomas Kuhn ant anticipated in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, that, would, that what would characterize our, our lives at times would be these shifts from the classic established paradigms to new paradigms. And with those new shifts would come new standards, new, new, new ideas or concepts of what con would constitute uh, best practices. And this, this growing world of these connected devices is just going to, to add further impetus behind that shift in paradigms, particularly the one from uh, reactive to, the, uh, to proactive prevention. And in this time of COVID, when so many now uh, have, have now have turned their attention to working from home of necessity or, or by legal mandate, uh, a recent survey of, of top executives believe that, you know, indeed the, the cyber threats have increased. And, 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 and due in part to the, the way in which employees are now working from home. So it just adds further to that complexity, the expansion of those, the, the threat profiles, and then the, the rate and pace at which the, the adversaries are, are increasing. And um, I mean, it's one of those forces that, as I said earlier, when I, I, I opened the, these remarks that pushed me personally to, to look for these defense and depth structures that would pr protect me when, when my efforts up high failed, that I would have uh, some means to fall back on uh, other protection uh, devices or, or means to to mitigate that. And of course, if the number of potential, uh, if that number is increasing to 75 billion by, by 2025, it's just going to make it all the more a, a rich environment for the adversaries to to come at me or at us. So with, the, with that, it, with, you know, with those deficiencies in mind, the, the limited ability of us to wrap our cognitive minds around the, the pace and weight by which, let's say, malware is morphing out there, we really had to move to a point uh, of, of advancing security designed with, with those limitations in mind. Um, 
what unfortunately happened in many cases with those limitations, the, the, those in charge of the environment just said, you know, forget it, I'm just going to put in some strict security control over the use and, and, and put emphasis on that over whatever might be the, the end user experience, the use and convenience of those uh, experiencing the network or the device. I think that's why maybe Bob Dylan here says, I accept chaos, but I'm not sure whether it accepts me. If you were talking about an IT environment, it would probably be in large part because of the, the friction he was experiencing as uh, you know, executives, 95% of us sit out there that we understand that our employees are making mistakes and it puts the data at risk. They say, well, that's just un unacceptable. I'm gonna go ahead and advance whatever controls I have to to secure that. And too bad if the end user uh, doesn't have a pleasant experience. And so again, part of what goes on and, and has given way to, uh, I think Bob Dylan's experiences here. But what we've been able to do actually with the advent and the arrival of AI, I mean, there was never more critical time for the, the power and strength and scalability of AI to arrive than in an environment where you're seeing that kind of proliferation and in endpoint detection. AI enabled us to come up with a preventative response to viruses based on math models that have a predictive power of, uh, in some instances, almost three years out ahead of when a virus is going to appear. It's with that kind of strength and prowess that AI brings that, that makes it so timely as we see these numbers ratcheting up to, to 75 billion. So, uh, I mean, at, at that time, it also turned the classic paradigm of, of reactive detection on its head and, and, and allowed pro, proactive prevention to, to move in. But AI has had the strength to also turn its attention to other aspects of, of our security efforts, including what we classically call endpoint detection and response or the forensics piece, uh, when inevitably, and even the AI folks are saying that with the strength of AI, the conviction and, and conviction rate they have against incoming viruses is as good as 99.7%. In my mind, I still hear, well, there's still these 0.3 out there that we need to be worried about and that in some shape or form would require that we have a forensics capability that can, can handle however diverse and varied these uh, 75 billion devices are and a forensics capability that can be applied to that 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 size of an environment and uh, again in its own way it's sort of had had its equivalent of, of signatures you know, we call them indications of compromise though in in the forensics world but uh, but again are are those that the bad guys know they can tweak in just subtle ways that would escape classic anticipated understandings of what these indications of compromise are and again the rate and pace at which those are changing would exceed our cognitive abilities and so again ai even in that space is offered or lend itself to to strengthen our position in this 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 growing environment and then there's finally a third area in the area of identity and access management where you know the paradigm of the the castle and the moat or the strong outer perimeter where you know, in a, in a person approaching or wanting entry would give a you know a, an alphanumeric sequence, or maybe even use two-factor authentication, but it would be a, a singular event at that perimeter. After which we'd allow them in to the kingdom and the soft GUI inside, and they would be free to roam around and and advance whatever they do. And of course, we've known historically that that has given away to given way to a, a whole host of of problems and challenges but to to do do more than that again uh, we hit up against our our cognitive limits as humans but again uh, with the help of ai now have an alternative in what we call continuous authentication just as with the uh, the the antivirus where we've we've assessed the the files out there in the internet into whether or not they are what we call benign or evil files and and how we did that basically is the mathematicians extracted millions of attributes that made a file uh, good or benign and those that made it evil ported uh, put a an integer value on that and ported it over to a math model that then allowed it to predict with the accuracy of 99.7 percent whether or not that 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 file was good or bad. In like fashion, we can turn that prowess to considering us as humans, even with the millions of attributes that make up stuff at any moment, whether on a continuous basis, not a single instance, but on a continuous authentication basis, uh, continually uh, declare whether or not I, as a, as a, as a user, uh, entitle and merit the trust that we might otherwise extend to me.
and whether that's how I type on the keys, uh, where I'm uh, coming in, the sequencing of the sites that I go to, even leveraging some of the classic biometrics that have been in part, that we pull that all together in a way with the health and strength of AI, because otherwise that kind of that kind of data flow would just would have overwhelmed us normally. But with with the power and strength of AI, we can now run uh, continuously wherever we go on whatever design, device, wherever it might be at whatever time. You know, with that strength and power, being able to determine whether the trust is uh, appropriately extended there. And as we do that, what we suddenly see happening is we we move to this position of of considering zero trust versus zero touch, where classically it's been considered as a as a, um, a competition or a conflict. Well, what we see with AI being introduced into that, we see the pursuit of zero trust, or I, I really prefer to say continuous trust, because I, I hate to, to cede anything to the bad guys or to give up something we valued so much as trust to the bad guys, but so I, I prefer prefer to call it continuous trust. But we get we garner that as well as at the same time. A, a reduction in the friction that the individual experiences so that they have the sense or come away with a sense that the, the network is almost a zero touch position with regards to their engagement in daily activities. And that's a nice synergy to have to come together. Finally, the CIOs with whom we partnered for, for decades are not gonna have to continue to take abuse because of the, the poor user experiences. We see this strength come to, to bear. So we, what we, we, we finally see here is that the, uh, the defense is at human speed versus computer speed is that really the AI advantage is introduced into that where, again, we don't, we don't jettison what we as humans do. We marry it up nicely with what the, uh, the math models can do, combine with humans and, and machines together in this environment with these, these 75 billion devices so that we move with continuous trust and continuous authentication to an environment that we can tolerate. And again, remembering Tom or George Santiana said, those who can't remember the past are gonna be condemned to repeat it. One of the things we need to remember is how uh, ineffective we've been in historical situations where we've tried to go it alone. And again, I'm thinking of the signature-based antiviruses here. So what we're really left with then is what there is now being called out there in the community, the, 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 the reality of unified endpoint security, that no matter how that environment grows, how, no matter how and di many different forms the endpoint protection takes because of the small footprint that uh, math models can, can uh, uh, take up, it's something that we can, we can deploy and engage uh, that, that kind of diverse and, and, and numerous uh, environment and, and also empower the uh, endpoint detection response. And as, as more and more of us move to these mobile devices, and I, I think uh, the bad guys know that we've really moved to these because we've seen a, just a, a spike in the attacks against the mobile platform. And then this, this idea of continuous authentication, letting AI underpin all of that, let the, let the environment continue to grow as it will, we'll find ourselves positioned to continue to, to grapple with that. So we'll end up with the, uh, no matter what, the, uh, you know, how diverse our, our portfolio of, of mobile apps uh, uh, end up being, we will have this ability to, with AI driven threat protection under all of them to, to have an environment that, um, you know, won't hurt us, but will actually be the, the value add that we all hope that it would be, you know, Kai-Fu Lee in his book, AI Superpowers, made this observation. He said that as electricity was to the 20th century, AI will be to the 21st, and data will be the fuel that drives the generator. Think of all those handheld tools that made up the, you know, the 19th century, and that as they moved in, they all, you know, instead of the hand drill, you had the electric drill. I just think of the, the many different subtle instances the way electricity changed everything in like fashion as all these devices who, that are currently out there that don't have AI supported or, or infusion. And, you know, imagine how that world will change as, as, as that becomes the reality of this 21st, this 21st century. Um, interesting times in, indeed. In fact, um, I think the, the benefits that we're, going to that we're going to experience as we engage the unified endpoint security is, is going to be even more liberating as you look down over these different, uh, different advantages that we're going to, to enjoy and acquire. So um, in closing then, I mean, when you think about the new reality of, of, of work, or again, I've heard people call and say, hey, the distinction we used to make between home and work just needs to go away. It's just, it's, just, it's all just one bundle now. But the reality of, of moving to that kind of environment and closing the gap be, uh, between what was required of us in, in achieving zero trust, but at the same time, zero touch, you know, 
closing the gap and the tension between those two is going to be liberating as we uh, see this infusion of these billions and billions of di devices that are going to connect themselves uh, to the end, uh, the uh, the internet. Um, I think uh, at the end of the day, Bonaparte's uh, observation that the battlefield is a scene of constant chaos. And as I said, a lot of reasons why that's going to continue. The winner will be the one who controls chaos, both his own and that of his enemies. And that's affect what AI is going to afford and enable us to do. So much so that when I next meet with you and I happen to meet with you uh, in physical realm or whatever, the virtual, and I happen to pronounce upon you again, this idea that you think you live in interesting times. In fact, there won't be a doubt in any of your minds that indeed what I pronounced upon you wasn't a cursing, but indeed a new paradigm benediction. In the meantime, stay safe, be well. Thank you. John, we want to thank you again for that presentation. It was very informative, and, and I like how you're pulling in some quotes from historical figures. I think that elevates the discussion a little bit in, in a very important way. So, so thank you again um, for your time putting that together. And, uh, and then also, of course, now spending some time with us uh, to be live and answer some, some questions and uh, have a little bit of discussion. No, I'm glad I could do it. It's good to be back here in Utah. I feel like the native son returning home, and it's, it's good to be able to engage and uh, exchange these important ideas. Well, good. I'm glad. Just, just to kind of to kick things off, you know, again, for our, for our viewers, any questions or thoughts that you have, please go ahead and enter those in the Q&A tab down at the bottom of the Zoom platform. Plug in your questions there. We'll have some discussion with John here anything that came to mind from from that presentation but but John maybe to kick things off as, as folks are thinking about what questions they want to plug in you know kind of the the way you're describing the future can can seem a little bit daunting sometimes I mean there, there's <laughs> you the think? narrative of, yeah, of yeah. <laughs> in, increasing cyber attacks and there's so many more devices for the the adversaries as you describe them to to attack and and do these kinds of things and so facing that future, seeing the reality of what's going on, what what keeps you positive and optimistic and how would you say that other business leaders and cybersecurity leaders should also be able to be positive and optimistic? Well, we as humans have always sort of wished for and inclined towards an ability to to control our environments. We're control freaks. I mean, early on, we, we had good reason for that because that which we couldn't control could very likely present itself in a way that would kill us. So we had good reasons for inclining towards this perpetual notion and desire to control everything. But in fact, the uh, elements have just been too numerous. We, we kind of almost have to just cross our fingers in faith and so just hope that each day we take, you know, we, it, it may be our last, but we, we push hope forward. But now what I think gives me more hope than anything, and I alluded to this a little bit, is this, this uh, SE lab study that actually uh, measured and put some meat on the bones when it came to the, the predictive strength of these math models. Uh, this one math model was back, they went back uh, as she existed in 2015 and through NetPetty and WannaCry that occurred in 2018. And they took all this stuff that wasn't even around as she existed back in 2015, threw it at her, and she killed it all. You know, that kind of predictive power reminds me of that old movie, uh, Minority Report, you know, this is where fiction is imitating real life now. But I mean, it, that kind of predictive power over an, an environment that is just so numerous and diverse, as, as, as I described, uh, gives some solace to, to one's soul that perhaps, you know, with the technologies our friend here and is leaning in and supporting us so much so that we can, we can push the bad guys for the first time back on their heels. I know it sort of seems like most of my career, I'm on, you know, I've been pushed back uh, on my heels as the adversaries always took it to me. In fact, I think that in, in some respects, I, I feel bad for a lot of my peers who have left the industry. Uh, in fact, people come up to me and say, boy, John, you're still persisting in there. I mean, how long are you going to stay in this? Or when are you going to retire? And I think, well, you know, but for the enthusiasm and the infusion of energy that I think this predictive power brings with it, I, I may have joined my peers by this time and gone on to some of the other opportunities that are still out there. But I think. Uh, more than anything, it's it's that that potential, what that that portends for the future that gives me gives me hope, and that we all should take comfort in. As uh, any morning any morning we wake up, we can 
of course, just look at the headlines. You can see things that could potentially seem very daunting and discouraging, but uh, there is hope out there. And I say, hey, let's wrap ourselves in that and take take courage and strengthen that. And then there's those of us who are in the profession, and not all of you listening today might actually be security professionals, but know that there is a cadre of us out there that are committed to defending the community and leveraging the strength toward that end. You know, it reminds me, I don't know if, if you or any of our viewers are fans of, of old Western movies, but I grew up watching the movie Shane with my dad. Fantastic, classic Western film. And, and in there, there, there's a line where Shane says to one of the other um, characters, he says, a gun is a tool only as good or bad as the person using it. So I'm wondering if you can kind of draw the same connection with, with technology and with cybersecurity tools. Sure. And, and and because of that reality that every good potentially good tool could be actually potentially evil it does exact and require of all of us that particularly those on the cutting edge that we be very thoughtful in the way in which we embrace engage engage tools they can be un, what we call unintended consequences of rational well-intended actions and those unintended consequences can unfortunately at time be very bad and so it's that thoughtful consideration as we engage new technologies that are that are very important for us. But again, I, I, I wouldn't let that, that reality infuse or put a damper on the excitement with which we embrace the, the community. I mean, think back when uh, in the early days of the, the, of the bank robbers, you know, there was Willie Sutton who they, they confronted at the, at, as he was coming out of court one day and they asked him, Willie, Willie, you know, why do you rob banks? And he looked at him in amazement going, well, that's where the money is, you know? Bad guys are always gonna innovate and take advantage of the technologies that, that are there to somehow get at whatever is esteemed as valuable in an evolving society. And it was no different that time. I mean, imagine the first time the, you know, innovative bank robbers showed up to a bank with their Model T, robbed the bank and hopped in their Model T and sped away, at least in perception to the, the posse that was seated on, you know, good old horse flesh. You know, we didn't say, well, when we got to get rid of the Model Ts, they're just, you know, this is unacceptable. No, what we did is we quietly reflected is, how do we turn that technology to our advantage as well? And the next time we loaded up the posse with their own version of the Model T and that one of, you know, what is the saying? In any color they wanted as long as it was black. But uh, so, you know, we, we always adapt and adjust and, and hopefully what we want to be is out on the, the cutting edge of that so that we don't let the bad guys surprise us as how a technology can be wielded. In, a, in an adversarial way, but you know, and we do that at BlackBerry even. We have the, those uh, mathematicians and, and engineers who, who are paid just to wear their evil hats all day long, to sit in the quiet of their study and think about how, and even if we give them the advantage of knowing some of the inside secrets, how they might leverage and use that in a detrimental way against society. And, and you know, in that sense, try to stay out ahead innovatively with the bad guys. And, and in, in AI, we're, we're blessed in many respects in that we've got a jump on them. When you think that uh, some companies like BlackBerry have a seven-year uh, head start in terms of what our mathematicians have been doing in the, you know, those closets we locked them in, you know, the math model training, it's really the secret, secret sauce. It's the training that we give that math model, which is hard to leapfrog over when the, when the good guys have got that kind of leap on you. So we take some solace in that jump that we've got on them. But again, don't put too much weight on that because, again, the bad guys are incredibly motivated given the wealth that they're pursuing out there. But again, don't let that discourage you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that the daunting aspect of that uh, undermine, I think, the, the the legitimate confidence and 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 positive outlook we we maintain in terms of what the future will bring to us. Well, I, I think it's it's worth repeating that though the threats are real, that there is is a strong network of folks to help be kind of the first line of defense, and to help us deal with these things that are a little bit unexpected, and and. To, Expanding on that theme a little bit, the unexpected moving into the future, and of course the theme of this presentation, the future of connected devices, it seems today that, that this is moving so quickly. There's so much rapid progression in the world of technology and cybersecurity. I mean, I, I feel like we all just barely got used to 4G LTE <laughs> for our phones. Now we have 5G towers going up. We're seeing the ads for that. So can you talk through a little bit about how, how businesses can, can keep up with this exponential pace of change in cybersecurity and tech, and, and just some thoughts of kind of how to make sure we're, we're keeping our heads wrapped around it. Well, 
And that element of this world that we call the speed factor is is daunting on a number of levels, not just at the corporate level, but in the personal and individual level. You know, as 5G does away with the latency that caused the speed of 4G and 3G and others that preceded them to, to slow things down or to hit a wall, at least at the, the rate at which they could accommodate, you know, numbers like 75 billion. You know, as 5G opens that up, again, of course, the speed of everything churning around us is going to match that. So, um, you know, it's another element, it's chaos, complexity, and other conundrums. One of those other conundrums, I guess, would be the way in which speed is going to present itself in our lives and how do we as humans grapple with that? Because, I mean, the speed at which we do things just means that we can take in more and more, we get more and more done, which means more and more things can then fill up and then you, uh, you, you know, it introduces a, another source of that, uh, that angst or, or consternation. So again, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the benefits of pulling back into what we call the quiet of our study, where we can, we can reflect and pause, take a deep breath, and not get sucked along quite as, as, as unconsciously as we might with the speed that these new technologies you know, enable us to have. I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that when AI was first coming out, you heard a lot of the, the dialogue being framed, it's AI versus the humans. And I, in like fashion, I can see you know, uh, the discussion around speed being characterized uh, negatively uh, when in fact, I think if we, we thoughtfully approach it, we can pull it in where we leverage the benefits that that speed can afford, the liberating effect that it, it can, can enable us to do as we, you know, I just think the fact I just, I've circumnavigated the world now twice in my lifetime. I think, uh, you know, Magellan took three years to do that once, you know, uh, just the, the amount of ac uh, activities and elements that we can now pour into our life, given this, what the, the benefits of speed. Uh, it enables, it liberates us to pursue more interests than we might normally have been able to pursue in a single lifetime. Uh, if you look at the content and what we're able to achieve in many respects, you could say we're, we're actually leaving in comparison to Magellan, you know, 30 or 40 lives in comparison to what he was able to achieve in that single circumnavigation of the globe. Uh, so, I, I mean, so thinking uh, thoughtfully, uh, bringing to bear the benefits that that speed, but also not letting it so fully dominate that we we lose those aspects of our humanity that that most richly and dramatically present themselves in those quiet moments. So what I like to think is that speed will enable that the quality and maybe the duration, the amount and the number of quiet moments that we we can enjoy will be a direct consequences of the, the, the things we're able to achieve and take care of on the speed side that enables or liberates us to do that. And so I think, again, finding that, that balance will be part of the challenge, but we are up to that task. We faced that, that challenge before as a, as a, as a culture and as, as humans, and it's just, it'll be there again for us. So I, again, it's one of the things I look forward to uh, and actually discovering things that I can, I can now advance in the quiet of my study that I have uh, more of. Uh, look forward to to seeing just what aspects and forms that's going to take. Makes things, as I said, interesting and exciting. It, it does, and, and perhaps another way to frame that is that rather than looking at the growth of technology as a liability to manage, instead look at it as an asset to harness with some protections in place. But is that a fair summation? Is kind of one of the the main themes you want to deliver? Yeah, and I, I, I mean, we have examples in the past that should give us a reason to believe that we can succeed in that way. Um, when I was a young FBI agent, uh, the, the technology internet protocols or IP was just emerging. And when suddenly law enforcement and the communities learned that, you know, wiretaps that we used to use effectively against some of our most dangerous adversaries was suddenly going to be challenged because it wasn't going to be a constant, you know, voice stream that we were tapping into. It's going to be these packets flowing off all over the place. How do you, how do you maintain or leverage that critical uh, functionality in a way that will preserve well, we put our heads together as a law enforcement community, the Congress, the private sector, everybody chipped in. We came together and formulated what was our best guess as to legislation that would, would assure that continuity. 
there was some hand wringing and worry that, oh no, you know, we're gonna, this is going to mean dogs and cats are living together. All sorts of terrible things are going to happen. And it, again, possible, uh, but uh, we went ahead and launched that. Uh, and in fact, not, none of those projected things did happen. Doesn't mean we didn't have to continue to tweak and adjust it, but that we have good reason to believe that historically as technology has evolved, we put our minds together, worked as a community with these contending interests and worked through to the best known solution at the time, launched it, monitored it, tweaked it as we needed to, and will continue to do so as even new technologies come on. So again, I think good reason historically to uh, be confident that we were up to the task at hand and that that bodes well for us in terms of the future. Well, I gotta say, I appreciate the very subtle Ghostbusters reference, whether that was uh, intentional <laughs> or not, it was great. But, but again, it helps to put things in context that doesn't have to be this calamitous, dismal future, but there's a lot of opportunity in the future with, with these kinds of things. So maybe uh, before we kind of sign off, just a, a general question for you. If, if you were to say, what, what is your top thing that you're looking forward to in regards to the future of connected devices, either some budding new technology that maybe isn't quite developed yet, but give us a sense of what's on the horizon that you think will be a tremendous um, period of innovation for the business community. Well, and, and, you, and the speed at which it's arrived, you know, you look at the uh, the role of autonomous vehicles and uh, the liberating effect that has. Uh, I know we uh, we had to postpone the Olympics, but I, I was aware of some of the innovative ways in which autonomous vehicles were going to move athletes around the Olympic Village or something. It's just amazing the rate and pace at which uh, certain mundane aspects of our lives once automated with the underlying support of what AI brings into the mix, you know, we wouldn't be able to have autonomous vehicles unless we had the AI that could it, could it in, absorb at any moment all the variables of an environment as you're moving through that and, and, and make the proper adjustments. It's, the, it's the, the, the manifestation of these ways in which the mundane are going to just transform themselves in ways that I think will have a liberating effect. Uh, what, you know, uh, Scoble and Israel wrote the book, The Age of Context, that had some interesting insights. And, and what they, they put forward in that, in this emerging world, uh, is what they call contextual richness. You know, the, the way in which all those contextual variables are absorbed and brought together that creates a quality and a richness in life that heretofore we couldn't enjoy because we are so caught up with the mundane and trying to address the, the, the individual components of daily living to the point that we weren't liberated or, or freed up to pursue what we consider other more enriching aspects of life. And so I think it's, you know, that that's the prospect or the, the aspect of the future that I, I'm just, uh, every day I wake up, I look for another manifestation of it because it, it makes it makes it so exciting. So I, I'd, I'd have to say that would be uh, my answer to that. Well, that, that certainly does give cause for optimism and we'll of course be tracking those developments as they progress. And thanks to you and the other folks who are participating in the Cybersecurity Leadership Council here at the Chamber. John, thank you again for your time today walking through these concepts. As a reminder to, to the viewers out there, all this content will be available online um, on the Chamber blog. We'll get it up on the Chamber Cybersecurity Leadership Council website as well. And then of course our YouTube channel you can watch these videos there also. We'll be sending some additional information out to, to our cybersecurity folks via email for the next phase of this conference, which is throughout the month of November. We'll have four more sessions of these every Wednesday. And so with that, John, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. No, glad I could join you. And we'll see you all the same time next week. Remember, the Series 5 Apple Watch, we keep plugging that because it's a great <laughs> contribution from Strong Connections. The more of these you attend, the more tickets you get for that opportunity drawing at the end of November for that. And before we go, we just want to make sure we give a thank you to our Respond Level sponsor, Strong Connections, for helping to promote and facilitate this Cybersecurity Leadership Council Fall Conference Series. Thank you again, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Nick.